Bible with you, if you would please turn with me to Isaiah chapter number 41. Isaiah chapter 41. In this chapter, we see, uh, we see the conviction of those who have been worshiping false idols. We see the conviction of idolaters, but we also see the encouragement of those who have faithfully been serving the Lord, faithfully been, been looking to the Lord and worshiping the Lord. So in other words, this is a chapter where we see both correction and encouragement because it is possible to do both in one setting. It, it's possible to have some, some encouragement with some correction as well in our lives. And, and so we see that here in Isaiah chapter number 41 and looking at verse number 9. If you don't have your Bible with you, they'll put it up on the screen. It says, I took you from the ends of the earth, from the farthest corners I called you. Is anybody thankful today for a God who found you where you were? But that loved you too much to leave you there and took you from the farthest corners of the earth. And I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you and help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And all who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. And those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies. Time out. Who is searching for their enemies? Like who is, who is actively looking for an enemy? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm like, I'm hiding from my enemies. Not that I'm afraid of them. Maybe I shouldn't say I'm hiding from them, but I'm not looking for them. Right? I'm not, I'm like six foot 150. I'm not looking actively for a fight. I'm not actively searching for a fight. But apparently they are because God says, hey, though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. That's got to be, I mean, we go, we go home right now. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Though you've been facing some enemies on your job, you will not find them. Though you've been facing some enemies in your marriage, you will not find them. Though you've been facing some enemies, when you search for them, after what I'm about to do, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand. And says to you, do not fear. God says, I'm the one who takes your hand and helps you cross the street. I'm the one who takes your hand and helps you get to where you need to go. I'm the one who's actively helping you in your life. I say, do not fear. I will help you. Do not fear. I will help you. Oh, come on. That's good stuff right there. Do not fear. I will help you. God says, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to be the one to get you where you need to go. You don't have to worry about figuring it out on your own. You don't have to worry about making it on your own. You don't have to worry about handling on your own because I am with you. And by the way, God says, not only am I with you, but I've called you. God said, I have, I have called you. I am with you, but I've called you. So you are, you are getting help from God and you are called. There is no other reason to not feel able. There is no reason for you to not feel able in your life knowing that God is with you, that he is helping you, and that he has called you. God says, I am always with you. Whatever reason that you had for feeling less than, whatever reason you had for feeling unqualified, whatever reason that you had for not being able to do what God's called you to do, God says, I've thrown it out the window. I've handled it because you have no reason to think that you cannot do what I've called you to do. You have no reason to be afraid. You don't have reason to worry. You don't have reason to be ashamed because I am with you and I've called you and I've chosen you. And I will protect you because who God calls, he protects. Who God chooses, he protects. So for this week of Abel, for this final Sunday, I want to talk to you on the subject called and confident. Called and confident. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for today and for all that you've already done in this place. 
I thank you for your presence in this place. And I pray that over these next few moments that we share together, that you would help each and every person that's here today, not to see and to hear from me, but that they would see and that they would hear from you. I pray that you would help us to take what you say to heart and apply it to our lives. And we thank you for it today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Now, do any of you guys remember this? Do you remember the games that they used to play when you were a kid? I know some of us have to think further back than others. Like, I, I, the la- I was last in school, like, over 10 years ago. See, y'all look at me and you think I look young because I can't grow a beard. But I'm older than I look. And I remember the games that we used to play when we were growing up. And there were games that I liked. Like, I liked Four Corners. Anybody play that game? I liked Red Rover. Mainly because I didn't have to worry about stopping someone on my own. I could have someone help me. Lock arms. I liked playing uh, Heads Up, Seven Up. Are these games too new for some of y'all? Sorry. Are they too old for some of y'all? Like, these are the games that I played when I was growing up. Uh, But one of the games that I absolutely hated that was always played was Would You Rather. Would You Rather. I hated that game. Absolutely. Because it's not even a game. It's a question. It's not even a game. And I hated it. And, and, and people, they just, they always took it too far. Now, in case you've never played this game before, you don't know anything about this game, let me kind of just give you a little backstory. The premise of the game is that you are asked a question. Would you rather A or B? You're given two options. Option A, option B. Two choices, right? And you have to answer out of those two choices. You cannot say Well, like, I I don't know. Can I get some specifics? No, it's just this is the question, option A or option B, what's your answer? Then if you don't answer, then you lose the game. Like how, what kind of one-sided game is this? And if you lose the game, then they're like calling you a loser because kids are cruel. And I hated this game. People always took it too far, always. And, and, like, don't get me wrong, they would ease you in, right? They'd make you feel good about it. They, they would make you feel like it was going to be easy. They would tell you, this is how you're going to learn to make decisions in life. This helps you with your decision-making process. Do you trust me that I'm not going to give you some crazy question? Like, this is going to be easy. And they would ease you in. They would ask you things like, would you rather play basketball or baseball? <laughs> it's not a bad question. I mean, basketball all day, but I mean, that's not, that, that's an easy question, right? You're feeling, you're feeling good about yourself, so they sucker you in, and you're like, okay, I'll play that game. So then they ask you, like, would you rather eat a grasshopper or eat an ant? I mean, it's gross, but it's not awful, right? Like, I mean, it's, that's not a terrible question. Like, I could play that, right? And so they, then they get you feeling all warm and fuzzy inside. Right, and then they make you feel good about feel good about it. Like you're expecting some 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 softball throw again, and then they say, they get this look on their face, and like, would you rather have your arm chopped off or your leg chopped off? <laughs> well, that escalated quickly. <laughs> like neither. Then they ask you questions that you can't possibly answer because both choices are amazing. Would you rather marry Brandy from Moesha or Britney Spears? It's like, I can't choose between those two. This is not a fair game. And then it doesn't help when you don't answer the question because then they just keep coming at you. Like, like, would you rather get punched in the face or punched in the throat? Like, neither. Like, I'm looking at them like, you need Jesus. Now, you come to church with me this Sunday. But it just, it started. And they ask you these questions and, and you get these choices. And I hated the game. Because no choice was ever worth choosing. I hated it. Like like when I was given these options, Brandy or Britney Spears, like I'm not, I can't choose out of those two. You're going to ask me if I want to get punched in the face or punched in the throat and I can't say neither? I can't say I wouldn't rather nothing happen than get my arm chopped off. Why is somebody chopping off my arm? That's what I want to know. Is somebody chopping off my arm? Like, I have questions. If you're chopping off my arm and my leg, I got questions. I'm not just agreeing to it. I got questions. No option was ever worth choosing. That's why I hated this game, because it was like both choices were bad. You ever felt that way in life? Like, both choices were bad. Both decisions 
were bad. And that's how I felt about this game. But I didn't feel like either one was worth choosing. And today, a lot of us in our lives, we feel as if we're not worth choosing. We feel as if if we were put in that game, that somebody would need to pick the other option because we're not worth choosing. Like because of what I've done and because of where I've been, I'm not worth it. I'm not worth you choosing me. I, I wouldn't choose me. People wouldn't choose me. Nobody would choose me. But the truth is, God said you're worth choosing. God said you're worth choosing. That's the first thing I need you to see. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to read it to you again because I know that we're probably like, eh, I don't know if that applies to me. But in verse number 9, God said, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners, I called you. And I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. I have chosen you. And I have not rejected you. In spite of what you've done. No, I have chosen you and I have not rejected you. God said it doesn't matter what you're afraid of. It doesn't matter the past that you're running from. It doesn't matter the decisions that you've made. I have chosen you and I have not rejected you. You are chosen. You are called. And you are not rejected. You are not rejected. For everyone who's here today and everyone joining us online who feels as if you have been rejected, who feels as if you are unloved, you need to know that God's chosen you. God chose, no matter who left you, God chose you. No matter who forgot about you, God chose you. No matter who rejected you, God chose you. You are chosen. Everybody repeat after me. I'm chosen. I'm chosen. I'm chosen. You are not rejected. God said, listen, I chose you. He didn't say he chose your neighbor. I know they look good today, but he didn't say that he chose them alone. He chose you. God said, I have chosen you. I have not rejected you. And I love it because God did not put parameters around it. God did not say, I've chosen you as long as you blank. He didn't say, I'll choose you as long as you. No, he said, I have chosen you. I have chosen you. And I have not rejected you. I have not left you. And some of us, we feel rejected and we feel unloved, but we need to know that God said that we're chosen. You are chosen because you are worth choosing. You are not a lost cause. God said you are so worth choosing that he even took the time in a Bible that just has the things in it that we need to know. He didn't have like, like the internet to just inundate us with information. God said, in my book, I'm only putting things that matter. I'm only putting things that are important. So as long as people are preaching God's word, it is important. So to me, it's important for somebody to know that God said he chose you. For God to say that he hasn't rejected you. And he didn't stop there because he did not just say, I have chosen you. He also said that you were worth dying for. The next time that somebody tries to tell you that you're not worth anything, you need to remind them of your value. The ultimate price was paid for your life. The ultimate price was paid for you. God said, you're not just worth choosing. I haven't just not rejected you, but you were so worth choosing that I paid the ultimate price for your life. And it is time that we start living as if we are worth choosing. It's time that we stop acting like we don't deserve to be picked, like we don't deserve to be chosen. You are worth choosing. God said, listen, I chose you. And if I, the Lord of Lord and King of Kings, valued you enough to choose you, then it doesn't matter what anybody else says, you're worth it. Doesn't matter what anybody else does, you are worth it choosing. God said, you are worth choosing. I have chosen you. And as sons and daughters of God, it is time for us to live our lives as if we are worth choosing. We are not called to be somebody's mat. We're not called to be walked all over. We're not called to be isolated. We're not called to be forgotten because you're chosen. You're chosen, and it's time for us to live out of our worth. It is time for us to live out of the worth of a God who said that you are worth choosing. 
a God that said you are valuable. And he didn't put parameters on it. But God said, I love you so much that I want you to know that I choose you. I choose you. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, some of us just need to know that we're worth choosing. Some of us need to know that, that there's someone out there that said, I love you so much that I want to choose you. Nicole and I, we're, <laughs> we're watching uh, Grey's Anatomy. Okay, don't judge me, please. I also watch The Bachelor with her. I watch The Bachelorette. I'm whipped. And um, so we're watching Grey's Anatomy. And, and last night, the episode we were watching, th this lady, she, she's, she's in a love triangle. She's in a love triangle. So it's her and a surgeon and the surgeon's wife. I've been wearing my hubby shirt because my wife's a nurse. And I'm like, I want you to remember you're married <laughs> when you're at work. So, so she's in this love triangle, and she goes up to this guy, and he's married, because if he's married, he's off limits. If he's married, he's off limits. If she's married, she's off limits. She goes up to him, though, because he's been telling her he's going to leave his wife, but now he just, he just, he's not sure. And she goes up, and she's like, pick me, love me, choose me. And he doesn't because he goes with his wife because she's his wife. And I'm watching this and I'm thinking, but you know what, though? As much as I can judge this TV show because she's sitting here saying this, how many times do we go through life looking for other people to choose us when God's already chosen us? How, how many times do we go around trying to find people to accept us and to love us when we already have a Savior who loved us enough, who said, I don't just love you enough to die for you. And, and all these things, I love you enough to send you a helper. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And we're, sent, we're inviting everybody else into our lives but the Holy Spirit. And God says, I want to walk with you because I've chosen you and I want to help you in your life. You are chosen. You're worth choosing. You're worth cho Don't be looking at everybody else trying to get satisfaction from everything else when God's already chosen you. Save a lot of broken hearts. So God says, listen, I've, I've chosen you. I've chosen you. I've already called you. And as sons and daughters of God, your calling is too important. you gotta look at your you got to look at your surroundings. And if the people around you don't see value in you, it is time to find a new tribe. Because your calling is too important and, and life is too short for you to be surrounded by people who do not think you're worth choosing. Life is too short to be around people who don't find value in you. It's too short to allow yourself to be held back by the opinions of others who do not think that you are worth choosing. Or the opinion of yourself. Because the reality is, many of us devalue ourselves more than anyone else does. Many of us reject ourselves. And, and like, if you don't believe me, even right now, like as I'm preaching, some of us are sitting out here or online and, and we're like, you know what, this is a great message, Dustin, and everything is cool, but it's not for me. Like, it's good, but it's not for me. And the reason it's not for me is because you don't know everything that I've done. You do not know the life that I've lived. You do not know the decisions that I've made. Everybody else may be worth choosing. But after, after the things I've done that I'm ashamed of, the things that nobody even knows about, there's no way I am worth choosing. And I'm glad you brought that up because I started today in verse number 9. And that reminds me, I need to read verse number 8 because verse number 8 is who we're talking to. And we started reading in verse number 9 and we see that God says, I've chosen somebody, but we don't know who he's talking about. And it matters who he's talking to. It matters who he's speaking to. And so if it's okay with you, I would like to read in verse number 8 because it says, it's very important. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. You, Israel, my servant Jacob, you descendants of Abraham, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. All right, some of us, we still don't get it. I'm going to break it down for you. It's okay. This is what I'm here for. Because, see, God broke it down for me this week. Because I read that. And he took, it, took me back to it, and I read it again. And he took me back to it, and I read it again. And I'm like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be looking at here. Like, I can only read it so many times. But then God helped me see it, and I'm going to break it down for you. So it says, you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen. 
Now, those names are familiar. If you've, you know, if you've read in the Bible a lot or if you've heard the story a lot, Israel and Jacob are very, very well-known names. But they're also the same person. Israel and Jacob are the same person. It's, it's one and the same. Now, for those of you who maybe do not know this story or maybe it's been a while since you've heard it, I'll just kind of recap for you. There was a guy named Jacob, and he had a twin brother named Esau. Their father was Isaac. Isaac's father was Abraham, the father of many nations. So I, uh, Isaac had Esau and Jacob. Now, there's this thing in the Bible time where we're at that's called a birthright. And the birthright is the inheritance. Not just the inheritance, but it's the blessing, which was more important than the inheritance. Because you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have the blessing, then it doesn't matter. So it's the inheritance and the blessing. And every child wants it, but only one child can have it. And it's the oldest son. It's the oldest son. Now, Jacob and Esau are twins, but Esau was born first. Jacob tried to grab his heel, but Esau was born first. Y'all tracking me? So then one day, Jacob comes up with the idea to give a bowl of stew to his brother Esau in exchange for the birthright. And we talk a lot about Esau and how dumb this was and what was he thinking. But, but you also got to think, did he really think his brother would stab him in the back like that? So, so Esau had been out and he'd been laboring. He'd been hunting for the family and he's tired and he's hungry. And so Jacob says, I'll give you this bowl of stew if you will give me your birthright. And he tricks him into it and Esau's like, okay, cool. So then Jacob has one more step though. He's got to get the blessing of his father Isaac and he goes to Isaac and Isaac is just about blind so Isaac has to feel to tell who it is so Jacob takes wool and puts it all over his arms and, and over his body because Esau was some kind of nasty hairy that an animal had to be put on Jacob and I can say that because sometimes I think my arms are a little too hairy too so so Jacob puts on this animal skin and this wool and he goes to his father and his father feels on his arm and he's like, okay, you got the blessing because he thought that it was Esau. And Esau finds out and he threatens to kill Jacob. And so Jacob goes on the run for many years. And while he's on the run, he has an encounter with God. While he is running from what he's done, while he is running from his past, he has an encounter with God. And in this moment, God says, your name is no longer Jacob. Your name is now Israel. Still with me? So Jacob, who deceived, who lied, who tricked, who stole, among other things. Like Jacob, the dude was not a role model. And he did all of these things. And then he has an encounter with God. God says, your name is no longer Jacob. It is now Israel. Your name Jacob is associated with what you did. Your name Israel is associated with who you are. Your name Jacob is what you've done. But your name Israel is where you're going. But he still has a personality complex because he has two names. But he's not supposed to identify with his old name of Jacob, just with Israel. And so when I read it this week, I struggled. I don't know if it's, a, I don't know if it's okay for a pastor to admit that he read something in the Bible and struggled when reading it. But guess what? I'm a pastor. And when I read it this week, I struggled. I struggled. And the reason I struggled is because it says in verse 40, uh, chapter 43, verse 8, that God says, but you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. He calls him Israel and Jacob. And the reason that it bothered me is because why on earth would God refer to Jacob, his old name, instead of just Israel, his new name, when he's calling him chosen. Why would God call him Israel 
and Jacob when he's calling him chosen. And what God said to me this week is because he wanted you to know that even when you're Jacob, you're still chosen. He's the God of, of, of Jacob. He's the God of Israel. He's the God of them all. Because even when you're Jacob, you are still chosen. God did not just call him Israel, but he called him Jacob too. Because even when you are at your worst, God said, I still choose you. Even when you don't have the answers, God said, I still choose you. No matter what you're afraid of, no matter your past, no matter what you're ashamed of, God said, I still chose you. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you've been, you're still worth choosing, Jacob. I know you're ashamed of it, but you're worth choosing, Jacob. It's not just Israel that I want. I want Jacob too. God said, no matter, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're going through, no matter, no matter what you're afraid of and, 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 and all these things in your life that you feel like disqualify you and feel like you understand why nobody ever chooses you and you feel like you understand why nothing good's happening to you and it must be because God's mad at you because you're not worth choosing. No, God said, I've already chosen you because you were worth choosing. You are not a failure. You are not worthless. You are not a lost cause because you are worth Choosing. God said, you're worth choosing. But he didn't stop there. Then he goes on and he says, and guess what? You're protected. You're worth choosing and you're protected. You're kept safe because you are upheld. You're upheld. It said in verse, in verse number 10, so do not fear. Do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God says, he says, do not fear. Do not fear. Why? Because I am with you. When you're confused, I am with you bringing clarity. When you are afraid, I am with you bringing peace. When you are wounded, I am with you bringing strength. When you don't have the answer, I'm with you bringing the answer. When you are falling, I am with you, catching you, and upholding you because I am with you. Do not let the devil convince you that you are alone because with God, you are never on your own. God is always with you. He is always leading you. He is always guiding you, and he will not leave your side. God said, I'm with you to uphold you no matter what you're going through. And you're not weak either. You're not weak. God said, God said, I will strengthen you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. I will keep you. When you don't understand it, I am with you. Because you're chosen. And I'm going to uphold you. And I'm going to keep you no matter what you face. No matter what you go through. You will not fail. You will not fall. Because I am holding you. I am holding you. And you may just need to know today that even though you feel like everything is falling apart, God is there holding it all together. Because he will uphold you. And he will keep you. And he will hold you there and keep you safe as long as he needs to until you see lost opposition. Until you see all the opposition that you were facing leave your life. The thing that's been coming against you. The thing that's been stopping you, the thing that's been preventing you from seeing what God had. God said, eventually one day it will be gone. But until it is gone, I will uphold you. What a promise from a loving father who said, I will fight off everything I have to fight off until the day comes that it's not there anymore. God doesn't just do things halfway. We may have friends that will be there for us until something really bad happens. But God says, I'm going to finish the job. I will uphold you until the opposition is completely gone. I will uphold you until you see a lost opposition. He said in verse 11, all who rage against you. Everybody say all. All, all who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. And those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be 
as nothing at all. You look for your enemies. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. God tells him here, he says, listen, go look again. And if it's still there, it's okay. Go look again. And if it's still there, it's okay. Go look again. See, I'm upholding you, so it's okay if it's there because I'm going to keep you. But, but go look again. God said, go look again because one day you're going to go look and things are going to be different than they were the last time. One day you're going to go look and the enemy is no longer going to be there. Don't get discouraged just because you go back to work on Monday and your boss is still there. Don't call Pastor Dustin a liar. We all love our bosses, especially anybody who works at Elevation Point Church. But he said, he said, you go, I didn't get a whole lot of amen out of it, especially anybody who works. He said, you go and you look again. And if it's still there, you go and you look again. And if it's still there, you go and you look again. And if it's still there, you go and you look again. And if it's still there, you go and you look again. You go look as many times as you have to until one day you're going to look and the opposition is going to be completely gone. Because God said, I'm going to finish what I started. I'm going to finish what I started. And you will look and your enemy will be gone. One of my greatest enemies in life are snakes. Literal snakes. Like, I'm not calling people snakes. I mean like literally snakes. Can't stand them. I'm afraid of them. We've lived on this, on, on 12 acres for like almost... About a year and a half now. And I've actively, like, I, I made fun of them for searching for their enemies. But, like, Nicole will tell you, I, I come in after cutting the grass, and I'm like, I didn't see any snakes. Had not seen a single snake on our property. Twelve acres, woods, all kind of stuff. Had not seen a single snake the entire time. And I've been looking for them. Because, see, it's always when you're not looking that it takes place. And last week, it had been raining a lot, not, not the torrential downpours we just had, but, but last week it rained a lot too. And, and I went out into the, the backyard. See, we have a fenced part of the backyard and then the rest of the acreage all back there. So we had this little portion fenced, and I was in there because a, a huge tree limb had fallen. I say huge. It's big for me. And I went out. And I picked it up because I was just going to throw it over the edge of the fence. And when I lift up the limb, there is a snake <laughs> chilling right there. Now, I'll be honest, this thing was probably closer to a worm size than a snake. Maybe about this long. Maybe about that thick. But I didn't like it because he was looking at me. With that look, you know what I mean? That, that look like when I get big enough. You're going down. And, and, and I didn't know what to do because I'm like, I'm totally unprepared. I just went out there to throw this tree limb away. That's the only reason I was there. So I didn't know what to do, so I just went back inside. <laughs> and, I, and I sent a picture to three people because I've seen a lot of stuff online about, you know, well, you shouldn't kill them. It's their, you know, it's their home. How would you feel if somebody came in your home? And, and I'm like, well, it's my property, but it's okay. So, but I, I don't know, I was just uneasy about killing it because he was so little, it, was, it wasn't cute. Some of y'all, sick. He just, he was a snake, but I didn't kill it because I didn't really have anything to kill it with. And, and so I went back inside and I sent the picture to three people. And one person was like, I don't think he's big enough to do damage. I didn't need that kind of negativity in my life. <laughs> I put that text message to the side, then I listened to the other two because I had one person who said, I mean, it's little. But I'm not trying to have a snake in my backyard. Like, preach. And the other one said, this is my favorite, I would kill it and ask questions later. <laughs> my kind of guy right there. Because I was, I was asking, is it a poisonous snake? You know, and it's a poison. I'd kill it, and then I would ask questions later. So I'm like, okay, i got to protect my family. I will protect this house and the property around it. And so I'm like, babe, it's starting to rain, but I'm going back out. Pray for me. 
We lay hands, you know, she prayed for me. Judas started laying hands on people now, so he had his hand. So we're praying, and I was ready for bed. So I'm in shorts, and like, I, I, I got boots. I looked so ridiculous. And, and it's raining, so I'm holding a shovel in my left hand and an umbrella in my right hand. And I'm out there walking around. Now, I thought, I'm protecting my house. I'm going to get a little respect. When I got back inside, I found out that my wife videoed the whole thing <laughs> and sent it out to all of our friends in a group message. But the reason she was laughing so hard not only did I look ridiculous, and I thought about showing it to y'all today, but I knew I would never recover. So there's some things I'm just keeping to myself. And so I'm, I'm out there, and, and I'm not kidding. Like, if you see the video footage, you would know I was terrified. I was terrified because I'm thinking, where's mama? Where mama snake at? You know, I don't know if they travel like that. I don't care. I'm looking for them. And, and I'm walking around. Like this, like I'm not exaggerating, okay? I have video footage to prove it. And I'm looking everywhere that I can with my shovel to try to take out this snake that I'm rightfully afraid of. And I'm looking, and eventually I came back inside, and on the video you hear Nicole laugh, and she's just cracking up, and she's like, I don't think he could find the snake. <laughs> Laughing so hard. And I get back in, and after I kind of told her, listen, this is my home. I need respect. I'm just kidding. I didn't do all that. But, but I got back in, and, and God said, the fact that you were looking for an enemy that wasn't even there is the same thing that you've been doing in your life. You've been walking around afraid. You've been walking around timid. You don't walk in like you own the place. You don't walk in like you're a child of God. You don't walk in like somebody should choose you because you're afraid of what you're going to encounter. And God said the very, the very way that you walked out to look for the enemy that you had just seen and it was already gone, God said I'm about to do it just as fast for somebody at Elevation Point Church. They're going to go back to look again. And they're going to expect to see the same enemy there. But when they go back another time, it may be the hundredth time you've gone. But when you go look again, God said it's not going to be there. Because God said, I am removing the enemies from your life. You go look again. Because I'm removing the opposition. I am removing the thing that you've been afraid of. I am removing the thing that's been holding you back because you are worth choosing, because you are worth being upheld. You are worth being kept. God said, I'm removing the very thing that's been holding you back. I'm removing the very enemy. And when you go and when you look, those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. You need to start telling people, do you know who you're dealing with? Because I'm chosen. I'm chosen. I'm called and I'm confident. I'm called and I'm confident. If you walk around feeling unconfident, then you do not know that you're called. God said, I have called you and you are to walk in a confidence that cannot be taken away. Because I am with you every step of the way. Would you stand with me all over this place today?